You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Both Sides of the Prescription brings together Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron to discuss pertinent medical issues from both an alternative and traditional medicine perspective. So now, please welcome the hosts of Both Sides of the Prescription, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Welcome, everyone, to Both Sides of the Prescription Radio Show on BBM Global, Tune In, and iHeartRadio. Tonight, I am joined by my co-host, my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling. Hello, Dad, and happy Father's Day week to you. Oh, gosh, thank you. I didn't know I had a whole week. You're um, getting a whole week this year. Wow, that's fantastic. I wish I would have known that on Monday, but I will take, uh, I'll take it. Does that mean you haven't been getting the daily presents that I've been sending to you? Oh, I'm sure that it's due to the um, the backup at the post office locally. I'm the Wisconsin uh, snowstorm in the June. Yes, I'm sure I, there's some explanation for why I haven't gotten the daily gifts. Well, the next week you'll get seven great uh, presents to show up all at the same time. If not, I'll contact somebody. So, but yes, happy Father's Day week to you and to all the fathers listening. Uh, we are going to continue the conversation tonight, sort of the same format we had last week. Uh, we still had a couple important topics uh, we needed to discuss in health and wellness and uh, news that you could use to better your life. So before we get into that conversation tonight and talk about sort of that hodgepodge like we did last week, let us, uh, like we do every Wednesday, tell you a little bit about ourselves and why the show came to be. So I'm Dr. Megan Kirschling, and I am the daughter, the proud daughter of Dr. Ron Kirschling. Uh, growing up with a dad that was a traditionally trained doctor as an oncologist and hematologist and a mother that was a nurse, obviously I was exposed to uh, the traditional ways of medicine and health and wellness. And somewhere along the way, which I actually couldn't even tell you how this came to be, but somewhere along the way, I started to get really interested in alternative, started to look more at why we didn't uh, put more emphasis on nutrition and exercise and why these things were sort of the other part of medicine and the part that especially you know, a couple of decades ago, we didn't talk about that. We said that it didn't matter that we could be put on the right prescription drugs or have the right surgery. Uh, and we all of a sudden didn't have to look at those lifestyle changes that we were making. And so somewhere along the way, well, in college, I had decided that I wanted to take more of an approach that was alternative and lifestyle based. And that sort of set off a couple dominoes. And what it did is it let me go from a nurse to a chiropractor to a nurse practitioner to putting it all together and realizing that everything has a place in medicine. And so I've really sort of evolved into a provider that wants to look at both lifestyle, nutrition, medicine, surgeries, all of those things and work with my patients to really find the best approach for each person individually. But one of the things that I've realized is that being in different areas when it comes to health and wellness and being um, in different uh, really facilities and different clinical settings, that a lot of times these conversations not only aren't had with patients and uh, healthcare consumers, but they're not uh, really discussed among providers. That a lot of times these conversations 
uh, if you talk to one side about, you know, alternative, you will get the, oh, that's voodoo. There's no importance for that. Those, you know, aren't real doctors. You know, there's a lot of things I've heard if I'm coming about it from that way. But I also hear it the other way too, that, you know, a lot of times we will instantly in the alternative world say that all medicine is bad and we'll make blanket statements and all medicine, you know, is just trying to kill you and that it's not looking at the root of the problem or the root cause. And I think this is doing a huge disservice for individuals. And I think this is doing a huge disservice for healthcare in general in our country. So I wanted to have these conversations. I wanted to look at things from both sides and I wanted to have them with my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling. So Megan, listening to you, what came to mind is that uh, you actually represent what we're trying to accomplish on this show and the fact that you've uh, moved from a traditional nursing education to what's considered a more alternative uh, healthcare provider, such as a chiropractic, and then back uh, to uh, being a health practitioner. And in your practice, uh, you're trying to put all of that together. In, in looking at my interest in this, um, what I've seen in 30 years of practice as a medical oncologist and hematologist is that um, while the providers oftentimes will put up fences around them and guard their information, patients don't have those fences. And they're interested in their health and their sense of well being. And um, they are very open to trying anything that will work. I think that's that's the criteria that they work they they go by. Do do they feel better? Do they have a better sense of wellness? Is their health better? And as a consequence of that, when they have looked at, for example, cancer patients who one could argue are exposed to some of the um, tip, most traditional kinds of therapeutic interventions, you will see in the studies that are done, there's a very high percentage of those patients who also look at complementary or alternative approaches also to fight their cancer. So I'm convinced from my experience with patients that what you're trying to embody is really what our patients want. They want the ability to go to healthcare providers that they trust who can integrate services in such a way to help them in whatever way they can to have better health. Mm -hmm. And so, um, of course, we started this show hoping to have people look at questions from different sides, but I've become more and more convinced that... Um, this is something that our patients are really teaching us that, yes, they want us to communicate. They want us to share information. Uh, they want us to all be active participants, hopefully with the common goal of helping our patients in terms of health and wellness. Mm -hmm. And I think an important part of that, too, is that this being very patient focused in healthcare focused, I think it's because there is a new revelation or revolution of people really needing to find different answers that a, sort of that old paradigm of, you know, one person having all the answers or one side of medicine having all the answers. I think we're realizing that um, a lot of people are looking for other answers and a lot of uh, a different way to look at some of the things that they're struggling with. And that really, I think the power comes from incorporating all we know uh, from health, wellness and medicine in general. Well, you've convinced me that, um, you know, one of the issues that we really need to address is long-term solutions to the evolution of chronic illness in the United States. And I think in looking at that, uh, there, there are two important points that I see. One of them is that in many respects, honestly, traditional medicine is failing people with chronic illnesses in terms of bringing them back to health. 
And then I think the other thing is that our health care system cannot sustain itself mm-hmm. in how we currently look at chronic illness. And unless we can come up solution, with solutions that um, modify chronic illnesses or actually allow people to live longer with less intensity chronic illnesses, uh, we're, we're in a real problem in the United States in terms of uh, our health care situation. And I really think this comes back to what I was saying at the beginning is that that's what I've really realized. And, you know, it's been a long process for me to realize this, even though this is even going to sound maybe a little bit elementary. But when we really look at the way that you said it, which I think is really enlightening, but long term solutions to the evolution of chronic illness and disease. But one of the things is that for us to really look at what we need to do to get a handle on this, we have to look at the whole comprehensive picture. We have to take an approach to it where we're not only going after and trying to change pathways or support pathways or decrease inflammation or fix broken pathways, but we've also got to stop what's ever causing that uh, chronic illness or disease. And I think that that's where a lot of times lifestyle and diet and nutrition come into play. Because if we leave, if, you know, our house is flooding and we leave on that giant, you know, faucet or leave on that hose that's pouring out the water. So maybe that's the food we're eating or not exercising or not meditating or not doing any stress reduction. So we leave on that source of the flood, but then we try to go after it with supplements or medications. We're not really coming up with long-term solutions. We're coming up with short-term solutions to try to just shut down that and clean up that mess from the flood, but we haven't really gotten to the root of the problem. So that's where I think that we really have to, when we're taking a comprehensive look and looking at long-term solutions, we have to take a full approach of looking at lifestyle um, and also pathways, genetics, all of those things. Now, this is an example of, I think, where that kind of integrated approach can make progress. And, um, there was a new governmental progress report uh, on the question of cancer and de- dying from cancer. And this looked at the progress made f- over the last uh, approximately 20 years, from 1999 until 2015. And what they found in that period of time is that the overall cancer death rate fell by 1.8% per year among men and 1.4% per year among women. They found that the number of new cancer cases dropped 1% per year uh, between 2008 and 2014. Now, what can you attribute that to? Well, I think that you honestly can attribute that to certain things that you would would relate to traditional medicine, uh, such as technology that allows earlier diagnosis, Uh, You might attribute that to traditional medicine in terms of some of the newer treatment options that have become available that can fight cancer. But in this government report, I think accurately, they also said that a very huge uh, contributor to this are health style changes. Uh, One of them very obvious in cancer is smoking sensation, but also they recognized healthier lifestyle habits. So I think this is this is just an example that you know you can make progress in a more viewed illness as a chronic illness like cancer um, if you look at it in a multifaceted way. Mm-hmm. And I do think, you know, it'd be interesting to see what you think, because you've obviously been in the cancer arena now for 30 plus years. But I do think that there is more of a approach now that all of it does matter. Uh, You know, even from some of the cancer centers that we're seeing um, pop up throughout the country are looking at mind body wellness and things like that, where before, you know, I'm sure even like a couple decades ago, some oncologists uh, and even more mainstream uh, ideology would have said that lifestyle had absolutely nothing to do with cancer. You know, I think that some of this has to do with finally coming to terms with the fact that to look at ourselves as sort of separate 
compartments that serve functions in our body that all act independently to really understanding that our bodies are interconnected in such fascinating ways. I think that realiza realization brings us to having to recognize that lifestyle uh, really does matter in terms of one's health. Well, and the first part of lifestyle that I want to talk about after this break is breathing. I have a really cool research article uh, that talks about breathing and how it affects uh, our brain and how it affects our life, our emotions, and our memory. So uh, stick with us. You are listening to both sides of the prescription, and we will be right back after these commercials. Hello, everybody. This is Coach Betty Louise, and I have a question for you. When is the last time you looked in the mirror and saw your amazing beauty and sexuality? 80% of women do not have a positive body image. 97% of women do not like something about their bodies, and over 10 million women have eating disorders. In addition, at least 40% of women are sexually repressed, and one in seven marriages are sexless. I've just completed a book called Healing with Pleasure Medicine. What I will teach you is what gets in the way of your ability to see your beauty, sensuality, and sexuality, how to shift your perception to increase pleasure throughout your entire day. Okay, the place to find all of this information is CoachBettyLive.com. One more time, CoachBettyLive.com. Look forward to connecting. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the prescription on BBM Global, Tune In, and iHeart Radio. If you guys have any questions, want to join in the conversation, or just want to say hi, or even call and just wish a happy Father's Day to my dad, the number is 866 451 1451. Maybe this will be the week dad someone calls in to say happy Father's Day to you. I'm going to remain hopeful. Maybe if so like may one of your other children is li are listening or something like that. Oh, wouldn't that be something? Yeah, Greg, Gretchen, and Michael, it's, a, it's time for you to call in. <laughs> so, Megan, you said there was um, an interesting article that you wanted to kind of start out our discussion tonight. Yes. So when we talk about something we do every day and we talk about something a lot of us probably just take for granted and obviously don't think about a um, involuntary action we all do, breathing comes to mind. Obviously, we, you know, breathe about 14 times every minute. We don't think about it a lot. And I think sometimes when there's something like that, that's even though it's so vital to living, 
that we don't think about, we don't think it really matters, that breathing really isn't that big of a component to overall health and wellness. Well, there's research uh, from December 2016 that has proven that breathing is not just for oxygen, but the way we breathe matters. And so this is why I always say that I think really both sides of medicine comes together is because we are very evidence-based, but we're even now cutting edge research is coming out about something so functional and fu fundamental as breathing. So the rhythm of breathing is not only something that affects your brain, but it affects memory, um, fear, emotions, and overall your parasympathetic, which is rest and digest, versus your sympathetic fight or flight. So some of the breathing that you do, like in yoga and meditation, where you know, you're know you taking long breaths in and long breaths out, or when you're breathing through your nose, you know there's a very popular breathing technique where you're alternating nostrils. So you plug one nostril, breathe in, um, and then plug the other nostril to breathe in. Um, that actually taps into the brain and is a great way to not only calm the brain, but also to support it and um, build it up. So what they found is this is through Northwestern uh, Medical School, but they discovered that for the first, they discovered the first time, sorry, they discovered for the first time um, in 2016 that the rhythm of breathing creates electrical activity in the human brain that enhances emotional judgments and memory recall. So the way that somebody was breathing specifically affected both their emotions and their memory recall. And one of the things, the major findings in here that was really dramatic is that they found that breathing through the nose and when uh, you're able to breathe through the nose, you're actually able to stimulate the brain more, that you're more likely to remember and to have a relaxful event when breathing through the nose versus the mouth. And it's interesting because there's a lot of research, I think, coming from this and a lot of talk about certain things even where sleeping, that a lot of people are more mouth breathers than they are nose breathers. And so there's even um, some people out there that talk about if you are more of a mouth breather to tape your mouth shut and get like a breathe right nose strip to open up that nasal passage because you should be breathing through your nose when you sleep. That'll also help to regulate that um, calming parasympathetic because if you're sleeping and breathing through your mouth, you're sort of sending mixed signals to your brain that it doesn't get full relaxation and calming because when we breathe through the mouth is usually during more times of stress. We were meant to only really breathe through the mouth like when we're running from a saber toothed tiger and when we're in more of a stress response. No breathing is supposed to calm us down. And so the more that we can get through nose breathing, the more that we can actually calm down the brain. Well, that is fascinating. Um, as you know, I am particularly interested in the topic of mindfulness and in viewing our current um, circumstances in our society, there's a lot of discussion in terms of how one can trigger in a more mindful approach. And many of those options that are available are options that look at breathing. Um, they're looking at being very conscious of how you breathe. And it it's uh, interesting that some of those practices are quite specific in terms of breathing in through your nostrils. What's confusing to me in talking about chiropractic was the idea that manipulation of one area could have effects more distal from that, you know, or more uh, away from the area that was manipulating. And, um, you know, I know that there are theories uh, about how that might occur through the transmission through the nervous system, but understanding the location of this interstitium, it also makes me wonder if this may be a vehicle that can maybe explain in some cases some of those distant effects from um, from manipulation, which obviously is is typically in one area. Well, and I think that that's what we're learning a lot about when we really start to look into the science of some of the effects. And I will say this, I mean, I just had this conversation with a patient today is that 
you know, where I fall when it comes to structural work and uh, adjustments and work on, you know, whether it's the interstitium or the fascia or the muscles or whatnot, is that we always get better results when we take a comprehensive approach. So if we're trying to, you know, functionally change something like, let's say, headaches, that, okay, we can look at hormones and that we can look at digestive and we can figure out what maybe some of those toxic issues are or what some of those pathways are that are causing headaches. But a lot of times, you know, whether it's chicken or egg, there's going to be a lot of other factors that go into any kind of long-term chronic illness or disease. So this evolution of chronic illness or disease that happens in the body is going to along you know, during that period of time that it occurs have other effects. And one of the things that we see is the changes in the muscular skeletal system. And that's not just muscles and bones, that's muscles and nerves and bones and circulatory system and lymph. Lymph is a huge one and interstitial now, you know, um, that component is huge and fascia. And so the more that we can change those patterns, the more than that we can get somebody into new patterns and into a new evolution of wellness. And so that's why I think, you know, when we look at chiropractic health and wellness, I think that that's where the role is. One of the things that I always talk about and that I think is sort of telling is even the evolution of chiropractic, you know, it really came around in the late 1800s with Palmer doing the first adjustment. And in the late 1800s, he did it on a janitor who then was able to hear for the first time. And he did an upper neck adjustment. And because of the nerves that are being, you know, entrapped from that subluxation or segmental dysfunction, he was able to get that person to hear again. Well, the thing is, is that that was a powerful way to come into, you know, medicine is to see that kind of result. But one of the reasons why I think there is such a place for musculoskeletal work and chiropractic, but that it really should be in the whole grand scheme of health and wellness is because today I think we all have so much chemical toxicity in our environment and we have so many other things that we've been exposed to that we have to explore and treat those things and then also incorporate the musculoskeletal component of it with the adjustments and muscle work. Well, you know, it's hard is this for me to say this uh, because I'm supposed to be anti-chiropractic as a uh, as a traditionally trained uh, physician it is fascinating to me that I think evidence is dominantly pointing to to the fact that um, we just can't look at any organ system whether that's the muscular musculoskeletal system or that's the liver or that's the heart as an isolated organ. Um, everything I think is telling us that there are all of these um, intricate, beautiful relationships. And I have to agree with you, if you're looking at something from a health standpoint, you, you really shouldn't ignore any part of it. And you do agree with chiropractic because you will admit the fact, I mean, you are very open-minded, but in general, you know, even I think as if you, if you were the just mainstream, you know, old school oncologist, we now know that lymph work is very important. And so, you know, there's a lot of oncologists that are referring to lymph massage and making sure to sort of help that lymph component uh, for someone that's going through chemo or that's had, you know, lymph removed or whatnot. So, you know, those are things that are all in the same realm is that when we take a comprehensive look and we put it all together, it makes a lot of sense. And I think it provides better care to the patient. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe Tashandra Poulard. 
owner and CEO of House Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran-owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C., Ms. Pillard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Welcome back, everybody, to Both Sides of the Prescription on BBM Global, Tune In, and iHeartRadio. Dad, I'm not going to give up the hope that somebody will call in. So the number is 866-451-1451. If you don't call in today, write it down. Call in next week. We'll be here, same time, same place. So, Megan, this is something that we've not talked about much on the show, but is something something that's... uh, rapidly coming into play with healthcare, And um, I thought this was an interesting article that really is very thought provoking. And what this is, is it's uh, looking at a comparison of essentially a technique, which is the result of artificial intelligence uh, as compared to clinical judgment of physicians. So what this is involving uh, were scientists in Europe and the United States who taught a machine, a system, and this was called the convolutional neural network. That was just the, the name of this technology. And what they basically did is they, sh- they, they inputted into the, the machine uh, over 100,000 images of malignant or cancerous skin lesions versus harmless uh, skin lesions or moles. And what they did is they pitted the machine and its ability to differentiate or separate the two uh, versus um, a collection of almost 60 experienced dermatologists from different countries. And what they found is that in terms of the correct identification, the machine beat every one of the physicians. Um, It had a uh, success rate of placing the skin lesions into the proper category of 95%, where the doctors as a whole uh, picked it at 87%. Now, so wait, uh, repeat that. So the machine did 87%? 95%. 95%. So it correctly identified um, a malignant or cancerous lesion as such or a benign lesion as benign 95% of the time. And the doctors were what percentage? Collectively, they were at 87%. So there is a part of me, though, that thinks, well, and I think this would be the whole conversation of, you know, can we get medicine to be more robotic or more based on things like that, where, you know, it's more of just a computer, those kind of things. But I think there is a little bit of a benefit, and maybe even we could discuss it and come to the conclusion it's a big benefit. But if I was that person that was going in and getting something scanned, and let's say I was in the 5% where it was 
misscanned. That there is a part of me that thinks it's better not only for the human touch and the human component of, you know, having a human provider, but the fact that knowing that there's a little bit of human error, I have seen in medical practice how that little bit of hope of human error gets people to sometimes not hold on to their diagnosis to say, you know what, though, I'm not going to buy into this. Like I can get better or, you know, I'm not going to become a statistic. So I can also see where, you know, there's still, even though that machine might have a better percentage of guessing correctly, I think there's a lot of negativity in going to that kind of diagnosis. Well, I think you're right. And I, um, I mentioned the article not in the sense of trying to say that we're eliminating healthcare providers, but I do I do think that the issue of artificial intelligence is sort of reaching into every aspect of our society, and it's certainly going to move in, It's certainly going to move into to healthcare as well. Um, I think I think even more so this is going to occur as. Um, as there are uh, various shortages of healthcare providers, and uh, uh, the supplement, na- how you can supplement that with methods that I think we'd probably consider artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. No, I do think that that's interesting, um, but I just want to put out there that I sort of hope medicine doesn't go a hundred percent in that direction because I think some is lost in just going for a higher percentage of correctly diagnosing people well I think the the one thing that I can't um, I can't well I can't visualize it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen but um, there are uh, there's a lot of important things that a, a sincere a sincere authentic healthcare provider brings to the patient uh, besides just simply the diagnosis um, it's Definitely. the presentation of the diagnosis it's the trust that uh, is instilled at being able to handle the problem. And just as we've been talking about with other topics tonight, um, we we should never discount um, how we affect a patient. Now, that may Mm -hmm. sometimes be from a standpoint of making an accurate diagnosis, but um, also we may affect the patient's ability to handle a disease by uh, the trust that they feel in us. Um, how we uh, care for them. Um, and so those aspects of healthcare, which I think are very important, uh, at least at this point, I don't think artificial intelligence can touch. Right. And it just, it does sort of make me a little bit nervous because I think sometimes when we get too much into evidence-based medicine, and there's definitely obviously a place for it, but, you know, there is such a huge part of that human nature. And we also know that there's better um, outcomes for people if they just trust their healthcare team. And so that's where, you know, I think it's really important when we really look at the whole science of healing, there's so much that goes into it that's even more than diagnosis. And the other thing I'll say is I know people who have gotten the correct diagnosis in a fast, you know, method, and it doesn't necessarily improve outcomes. Uh, And some people who never get a diagnosis who get better outcomes because they don't connect to that disease. And so obviously diagnosis is a big part of healthcare, but I think there's a big discussion to have on, you know, all the things that affect healing and promote optimal wellness. I agree. Um, On the same line, um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think that this is exciting and kind of indicates where even traditional medicine is going, and that is uh, the continued research on what is is called personalized medicine. And um, this can be defined, I think, differently by different people, but it, it basically is looking at people's individuality by looking at their genetic information. And I found that there is a a program that's just being started, and it's called the All of Us Research Program. It's being put on by the National Institute of Health, uh, and it is planning to um, look at volunteers, looking at their medical records, blood, urine samples, um, having their genomes sequenced, and using that information 
hopefully to push forward with this idea that while we have commonalities, uh, we also are very, very highly individual people. And I think to me, this is probably, Megan, a, a, a verification of something that has been much more accepted outside of traditional medicine than I think inside traditional medicine. And that is, um, I, you know, I, in looking at oncology, we trust that we're making decisions about therapies that are helpful based on clinical trials, which, which emphasize the similarities between patients. But I think the push for personalized medicine is actually sort of verifying some things that have, I think, been discussed more on the non-traditional side about how we need to respect every, uh, each person's individuality. Mm -hmm. And really, I think that this is the way that medicine is going to go. And honestly, I think it's also going to go that way because we are seeing more and more genetic SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, those are genetic mutations that we're seeing um, because there's been just a lot of changes in our environment and our world and that we see that genetically, you know, there are certain mutations and enzymes that some people, you know, might process um, folate and B12 different. Some people might not be as good of detoxifiers and might be more toxic if they're exposed to mold or environmental pollutants. Some people um, aren't able to produce as much energy and might have breakdowns in carnitine or aren't able to process fats as well. And so, you know, this is where we talk about like MTHFR and APOE and all of those different genetic mutations. But we're learning that, you know, we really should be looking at this. And I think the uh, part of medicine that's really the forefront on this is, you know, psychiatry and psychologists that are looking at this already for how we might, there might be genetic variations that allow us to determine what is the best antidepressants and best anti-anxiety meds to put people on dependent on how they're able to individually break it down. And so this is already, you know, pretty mainstream in their world. And I think they're pushing it for other places in medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think it's going to continually evolve, and and I can only see this as uh, as uh, as beneficial, and so it really is this sort of um, dance between appreciating our commonality, but also deeply respecting our individuality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's the real important part is that when we look at this, you know, and you know, this is a big discussion too, with why some people obviously react and have negative effects to certain things. Even, you know, one of the major conversations about this is vaccinations. Why do some people get vaccinations and have absolutely no problems with them? And others, you know, there's some thought that they re react really negatively to them. And I think some of this lies in the fact that we can't be giving a one size fits all to individuals in medicine, that we have to be looking at individual variations and we have to be providing medicine based on that. Well, I, you know, I kind of, I like you bringing up that example because oftentimes, you know, we put we put the issue of vaccines into either vaccines are good or vaccines are bad, but I think it's much. I, I like the idea of it being more nuanced, as you've described, where uh, vaccines have to also be looked at in uh, in respect to the individual. Definitely. So we are on to our last break. So stick with us. You're listening to Both Sides of the Prescription on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Dupula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. 
Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counted counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru Way. Jenny Friend is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified clinical sexologist, commonly known as a sex therapist, with over 30 years of experience in the field of sexuality. She's been a researcher and teacher and is further trained in human development over the lifespan. She's also a published author and a radio personality. Her specialized training in lifespan developments means she can help individuals, couples, and families through difficult developmental phases. Her primary ways of working are through the tools of cognitive, behavioral, and psychoenergetics theories and techniques. Couples, individual men and women, and families are also welcome. She can meet in her office in Costa Mesa, California, or on the Internet through Skype at Jenny Friend MFT. Call 714-210-9200. You can also send an email from her website at www.centerforclarity.org. That phone number again is 714-210-9200. Welcome back, everybody, to Both Sides of the Prescription Radio Show on BBM Global, TuneIn, and iHeartRadio. So, Megan, um, one of the primary themes that we've had tonight, I think, is looking at healthcare in terms of... um, interesting way that you might have breakthroughs so you know it might be a breakthrough in terms of how you better understand the physiology of breathing Um, it might be a breakthrough by the recognition of yet another um, important aspect of of our bodies um, and possibly even something that might be described as a new organ called the interstitium it might be a breakthrough um, represented by what we're learning with the understanding of our genome, uh, or it might be a breakthrough from the advances that are made in artificial intelligence. But I'm going to talk about something now that I think you're um, you're probably not going to like. And um, now things are going well. I wish you a happy Father's Day. So I know, I know. Well, I'm, I'm going to just I'm just going to present it out there and see what you think about this. So one of the things that has been recognized with regard to the stomach was that when the stomach is empty, there is a branch of the vagal nerve, it's actually the posterior vagal trunk, which activates and that sends a hunger signal to the brain. And they have now began research on a technique where they can basically freeze this nerve, which they've sort of referred to as a hunger nerve. And in the initial testing that they've done, um, they have done this again uh, on, at this time, a relatively small number of obese people. But what they have found is that uh, following this fr- freezing procedure at 90 days, uh, they, the patients generally felt uh, less hungry, more satisfied, and uh, they had maintained uh, a weight loss of about 14% of their body mass index, which is a way of kind of measuring uh, a relative loss of weight. So um, 
you know, th- this is where we're learning more from a physio- physiologic standpoint. We're making advances, but is uh, is this the best way to interpret the not uh, th- this information? So I will say that the thing I like about this is the acknowledgement that that vagus nerve is so important because it is, it's sort of that two way highway between the brain and the stomach and it's cranial nerve 10. And it's a major component when we look at the brain and body connection, especially the brain and digestion. Cool thing, super cool thing. And I think this is actually a cool component and that will show you why I think we're going about this the wrong way though with treatment is We now know that whenever you have a concussion, so whenever there's a brain injury, it takes only about 15 minutes for the gut to become inflamed. And it takes about two or three hours for that gut to be on fire. And that's all because of the vagus nerve. So that connection between the brain gut axis is 100% the vagus nerve. So when there's inflammation in the brain, then because of the vagus nerve, there's huge inflammation in the stomach. It is also the reason why when there's huge inflammation in the stomach, you get a lot of brain symptoms, brain fog, not feeling right, like just brain headaches, all those things. It's because of this two-way highway through the vagus nerve. I don't necessarily agree with the fact that when there is inflammation and everything else is going on, that the number one best way to do that is to try to shut down and turn off that vagal um, response or just subdue that to try to subdue other activity. But I do like the fact that uh, we know there's a huge connection between the brain, the gut, cravings, those kind of things, and that's all through the vagus nerve. Well, um, obviously with something uh, of this nature, what we're talking about here is uh, very uh, preliminary data. Uh, To me, there are... In, in, in terms of the, the spectrum of surgical options for people that are obese, uh, this, this may be a, a less toxic approach than some of the other surgical approaches. But, um, you know, I, I agree with, I, I'm su- surprising myself in the fact that I'm agreeing with you on, on this, Megan, in that I think as we more and more kind of appreciate this interconnectedness anytime you purposely remove a part of that interconnectedness you just have to be very very careful um what ultimately not just on an acute or a short-term basis but a long-term basis might happen Well, I think we have successfully had a conversation to prove to everybody that things are just connected. Our whole body is connected and that we can't really in health and wellness and healing disconnect one thing and hope to get optimal results. Well, I think you're right. I think that's probably if we had to say there was this theme of the discussion tonight, we'd have to we'd have to say that's the theme that um, uh, looked at from a variety of different ways, uh, one comes away appreciating just a little bit of the wonder of the body in terms of uh, of how intricate it is, and how we j- we have to appreciate uh, how everything is interconnected as it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just think it's interesting because we really had a discussion that went full circle from, you know, teaching people about the interstitium and this component that's between the skin and the lymph to breathing and how important that is, that everything really is truly connected when it comes to health and wellness. Yeah. And I, and I think that, um, although these gains might be considered modest, um, I think the report that we mentioned by the government with regard to the decrease in cancer, uh, is a, is an example of how, uh, healthcare providers can work together and we can appreciate, um, what traditional medicine does and the advances that have been made, but we can also appreciate the, the, the importance of lifestyle changes in terms of uh, dealing with a disease such as cancer. Mm -hmm. And we are only as connected as the people and the 
tribe that we have created. So on this Father's Day week, I would like to thank you for all of the things that you have done. Um, I know I speak for all of the siblings and for mom and everybody else. And I speak for your patients too, because I've spent time with you in the clinic. But, you know, when we talk about connectedness and need, being connected, I think we're only as strong as the tribe we're around. So I appreciate you being that head of the tribe um, supporting me through everything I've done personally and professionally and supporting me through even as I went away from the traditional medicine world. And I can't tell you how many way, times along the way I've had people say, well, what does your father think of this? And, oh, my gosh, why did your father allow this? And the funny thing and the most amazing thing is that you never actually once have made me feel that there was ever anything wrong with what I did or that it would even have been a second um, thought in your brain that I would do anything else besides what I wanted to do in life. So for all the fathers out there, but especially for the father that is here with me on the show, I just thank you for all the things that you've done to um, help me in my journey, help me in my health and wellness and to help me stay connected to um, life and the family. So I would I would say only two things, Megan. The, the first is, if you could tell mother that I'm the head of the house, I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, I'll get the, I'll get like a singing telegram to come to the store <laughs> tomorrow. Right. And then the second thing is that, um, you know, I think that sometimes we think that if we don't win all of the arguments that we're going to kind of lose our place in things. But the fact of the matter is, and this is something I've, um, I think I've learned from you, Megan, is that looking at new things, looking at things a new way, never diminishing, never has to diminish what I already know. So it's possible that you can go into a situation open to other ideas and not have and not have to worry that, well, gosh, my identity is going to be lost or um, I, I'm going to be lessened. So I think that um, it's possible to work together um, and it'd be a win-win situation. I'm going to leave it at that. I think that's a great way to end the show on Father's Day week. I thank everybody for listening. I hope everybody has a great Father's Day weekend, and I hope everybody joins us next week at 9 p.m. Eastern for another episode of Both Sides of the Prescription. Thanks, guys, and have a great week. You've been listening to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. So many times, people are only given one side of the healthcare story. Here, you get both sides. Tune in next week as we discover Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron's both sides of the prescription. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.